All right, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Property Council's Forum, Section J, Transformed, uh, Stepping into Energy Change for Commercial Buildings. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Frankie Muscovich. I'm the Property Council's National Policy Manager for Sustainability and Regulatory Affairs, and I'll be taking you through this morning's seminar. We're gathered in this, uh, I think, lovely venue this morning to fill our minds with uh, useful knowledge uh, on transformative change. But before we get to all of that, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we're meeting on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation this morning. I'd really like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who are here with us this morning. We have assembled the experts for you. Um, so I'd like to welcome and acknowledge the speakers you'll be hearing from today. Uh, right in front of me, we've got Mike Dodd, Senior Project Officer from the Australian Building Codes Board. We've got Erica Kenner, the Acting Assistant Director from the Energy Efficient Communities Team at the Commonwealth Department of Environment and Energy. We've got Monique Alfres, Acting Head of Technical Standards for the Neighbours Program, and Taryn Cornell, Green Star Technical Manager at the Green Building Council of Australia. Before we go any further, just, uh, just, a, just a small word of warning. Um, this morning's session is being filmed, so uh, eventually uh, this, uh, the video of today's session will be uploaded to the ABCB's website. So at that time, we'd really encourage you to share that widely with your networks. It's really great. We've been, put on, been able to put on this uh, series of seminars and we want to make the content accessible to as many people as possible. So. Uh, the only people who will be filmed are those speaking up on the stage, so don't worry, you're not going to turn up on a video somewhere. Um, but please just note, if you'd like to ask a question, there's no obligation for you to identify yourself before you ask that question today. So we at the Property Council are pretty delighted to be hosting today's seminar in partnership with the ABCB. Um, this is one of a national series of events aimed at educating the industry on what is the first substantial change to Section J of the NCC since it was, uh, <laughs> since it was introduced over a decade ago? Uh, the running order for the day is, is as you see. Uh, please note, we'll, we'll be pausing after that first round of presentations to take some questions, and then we'll have a, a, a more, I guess, detailed uh, Q&A session at the end with all of our panel of speakers. And another just note on what's to come, uh, we've, we've received a lot of questions over the events that we've run so far, and I understand the ABCB will be taking on board a lot of those uh, questions and feedback, and they'll be putting together an, an FAQ section essentially on their website to respond to some of the questions that have been raised at, at this um, seminar series. So I mentioned the changes you're going to hear today, that there is the result of about four years worth of pretty comprehensive uh, technical analysis and industry consultation. Uh, the policy drivers for this work are taken from the Commonwealth Government's uh, target of a 40% increase to energy productivity uh, by 2030. Now that's set out currently in the Government's National Energy Productivity Plan, and there are specific measures in there that call on uh, the ability to, to raise minimum standards for both commercial and residential buildings. Although obviously the focus of uh, NCC 2019's major changes and today's seminars is focused on commercial buildings. I guess that policy mandate combined with the objective of Section J, which is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, that, that's going to require a pretty significant improvement in energy performance of new buildings from 1 May next year, um, the new Section J replaces the existing one after a 12-month transition period that we're, I guess, current, currently uh, uh, going through right now, but Mike's going to talk a little bit more about that um, as, we, as we get through the presentation. We've worked with a few organisations to offer CPD points for you coming along today, so uh, those are up on, on the slide there. Um, after today, you'll be sent a certificate of attendance for coming along today. There'll be some instructions on how you get in touch with each of those organisations to claim CPD points. So please look out for that. That'll be coming out after today. So we're going to be taking you through the most substantial changes. It's fair to say there's more of a focus on building facade changes, um, but we want to get a sense of who's in the room so that we can, I guess, address uh, you know, any questions up front that you might have. So I just want to do a, a quick poll of the audience to see who we've got here today. Um, could you raise your hand if you are an architect or designer? 
lots of those, great. Uh, ESD consultants, even more of those. Um, any mechanical or services engineers? A few of those. Um, uh, building certifiers or surveyors? Not so many of you guys. Uh, builders? Ooh, okay. Now I know who to shame for the rest of the session. Um, alrighty. That'll help us uh, as we go through. Um, just lastly, a really brief plug for the Property Council's, uh, I think, much anticipated update to our guide to office building quality. Uh, this is going to be released at the end of the month. Um, note that the, the delay in releasing this was so that we could ensure that uh, changes to Section J in the NCC were uh, adequ adequately recognised in our guide to office building quality. So you'll note that um, the parameters that reference energy performance are now consistent with the new, um, with the new Section J of the NCC. Uh, and, and on matters of housekeeping, um, bathrooms are, are just outside and in the event of uh, any emergency, we'll be following the lovely staff from establishment who will escort us out of the building. Uh, and with that, look, that's enough from me. I'm, I'm going to uh, hand you over to our first speakers. Um, the only thing to say is we're not pausing for a formal break, so uh, I'm going to be encouraging you to get up and stretch your legs or grab a coffee or a drink. We've got two and a half hours of hardcore Section J to go through this morning. Um, it's, a, it's a lot for early in the morning, so please feel free to get up and, and stretch and grab something to eat um, when you need. So without further ado, our first presenters this morning are Mike Dodd and Erica Kenner. Uh, for the past two and a bit years, Mike Dodd's been managing the project that led to the Section J update. Uh, prior to joining the ABCB, Mike spent about 15 years uh, in various roles with government Victorian, uh, <laughs> Victorian government bodies focused on sustainability programs in commercial and public buildings. And Erica Kenner works on energy productivity policy and Commonwealth uh, building energy efficiency with, uh, with the Commonwealth Government. She's worked in commercial building energy efficiency for almost 20 years and was also part of the technical team that developed the 2019 updates to Section J. So please welcome, uh, please welcome Mike Dodd. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, Mike from the Australian Building Codes Board. Thank you all very much for coming today. Uh, there have been really significant changes to uh, Section J of the National Construction Code for Volume 1. Uh, if you compare a, a building built exactly to the DTS so 2016, you're looking at about a 30 to 40% reduction in energy consumption, uh, depending on building location and uh, building form. Uh, but I think coupled with that stringency increase and greater energy efficiency, we, uh, the way that we're asking for uh, compliance to be demonstrated, the way that we're doing calculations, there's been some really significant changes there that we're asking of you now. Uh, so, and that's the bit I think which is probably most significant um, and sort of where a lot of the detail will be going through today. Um, so the first half of this morning's presentation uh, will be myself and Erica. I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, the structure of the National Construction Code, uh, it being a performance-based code. Uh, and the changes we've made to the performance requirement for energy efficiency, uh, then I'll be handing over to Erica to deep dive into the deemed to satisfy provisions for uh, building facades especially, but we'll also look at the changes for, for services. And then there'll be a chance for, to ask questions. Really, a lot of the questions we've been getting have been around the, the changes to the DTS. And then after the break, we'll, uh, or short break, uh, we'll talk a bit more about the new verification methods of Neighbours, Green Star, the changes to uh, the use of JV3 and also uh, JV4, the introduction of a blower door test as a voluntary compliance mechanism for building ceiling. Okay, so I said I'm from the Australian Building Codes Board. I just wanted to say a couple of things about the ABCB, uh, which may be of interest, uh, may understand where we're coming from, especially um, in terms of engaging with us if you choose to do so in the future. Um, so our main function is to write the National Construction Code and to do education materials and resource materials around it. Uh, we don't set building industry policy. We're a policy taker, not a policy maker. So we get a direction from something like the National Energy Productivity Plan or from the Building Ministers Forum. They ask us to investigate energy efficiency in commercial buildings. There's some evidence there, for example, that uh, 
it uh, can increase energy productivity or reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then we take that and we run with it. So, but we don't um, set buildings policy. Uh, secondly, we're a COAG body, a Council of Australian Governments body. So we have as much to do day to day with the various state and territory governments as we do with the Commonwealth. Uh, and it also means that when we make changes to the National Construction Code, it's in consultation with all the state and territory bodies, uh, which may be why some changes take a long time to get through, but it also means that uh, there's a, a rigorous approach around how um, changes are made and it means that changes can be uh, uh, locally uh, specialised. Uh, and finally, uh, we are not the regulator. So while we write the National Construction Code, we are not responsible for saying in a specific case whether a building is or not compliant or which version of the National Construction Code you should be using to uh, seek certification under. That's the, the roles of your, of your various... Um, uh, state and territory authorities and, and in consultation with your building certifiers. So just wanted to make that point, especially if the issues of compliance come up, which they often do in these type of conversations. I obviously have an opinion about compliance, but just that, you know, um, ABCB is not the regulator in that case. Okay, so the National Construction Code, uh, it's a performance-based code. Um, uh, it sets the, the minimum acceptable standards for health, amenity, sustainability, structure, safety of Australia's buildings. Um, it's been a performance-based code now for 20, 21 years. Um, I'll go a bit more into to what that means. Uh, when, we talk, when we talk about a performance-based code, what we're really talking about is that in each section of the code, there are a number of high-level performance requirements. So in uh, section J, uh, that's JP1 and JP3 currently, JP1, I'll go into a bit more detail in a sec, but essentially it's a high-level statement which says your building as a whole should be energy efficient. When we're talking about compliance solutions, we're talking about a pathway that shows equivalence with the performance requirements. So that may be through the deemed to satisfy provision, so you follow the cookbook approach and say I'm meeting all of these individual items and, and that will show that my building meets the performance requirement, it's deemed to be equivalent or I might use a performance solution, and uh, some of those are, are codified uh, within the NCC. Things like uh, uh, JV3, uh, um, we introduced Neighbours and, and Greenstar now going forward. Um, but hybrid solutions um, within the code are also possible. So if you're following JV3, for example, you're also going to be asked to and need to show compliance with some of the DTS aspects as well. Um, so when we're talking about a performance solution, it's not necessarily at the whole building level. It's another point that I think it's important to make. You can develop a performance solution just to show equivalence with one aspect of the DTS and then use DTS as your overall compliance pathway. But essentially all, what we're really doing is showing compliance with that overall performance requirement. The DTS or JV3 or JV1 are not mandatory legal requirements. The performance requirement is the mandatory legal requirement. That's what we're showing in, within energy efficiency. What we're talking about is a building in, on the whole that is energy efficient. Okay. So Frankie, I'll come back to performance requirements in just a sec, but uh, as Frankie mentioned, we have a transition period in place for the changes we've made to the code. So just to try and uh, explain that as I, best I can, from the 1st of May this year until the 30th of April next year, you can choose to use either the NCC 2016 energy efficiency provisions or the 2019 energy efficiency provisions. But you have to choose one or the other. Uh, from 1st of May next year, NCC 2019 will be the code that you'll be following. But we have a transition period in place. Uh, given the extensive nature to extensive changes to the energy efficiency requirements, uh, industry asked and, and we were happy to, to provide a one year transition period to give you time to get your head around the new provisions, more time for us to develop uh, resources for you to, to, to draw upon when you're, you're showing, uh, when you're designing your buildings uh, and, and essentially just more time to, to get uh, systems in place. So just to remember, you can use 2016 or 2019, but you can't mix and match. You have to pick a lane. And when you see the extent of changes we've made, uh, it'll become clearer as to why. Okay. Okay, so I just want to jump back to the performance requirement now um, before I finish up and hand over to Erica. 
So there have been changes to the performance requirement within NCC 2016. So, and just a reminder, when we're talking about when we're talking about uh, volume uh, one, section J, we're talking about commercial buildings, uh, class two to nine buildings, uh, including um, apartments. But the the changes we're making are essentially only to the common areas of apartment buildings. The the netters requirement for uh, the occupancy units is pretty much unchanged. Okay, so the performance requirement currently within NCC 2016, there are two performance requirements. JP1, which is a uh, essentially a series of qualitative statements saying a building will be energy efficient, I'll go into a bit more detail, and JP3, which addresses the greenhouse intensity of the energy source for heating, essentially uh, asks for a low intensity uh, uh, heating source. Uh, it's uh, essentially preferences gas and renewable energy over electricity. Okay, so what's changed for 2019? Uh, so first of all, uh, we no longer have um, the requirement around JP3 for greenhouse intensity of heating sources. Uh, and that's essentially because we've introduced now a, a whole of a building quantified performance requirement, uh, which means that there's no need to have a, a separate one for heating. Okay, so those series of qualitative statements about energy efficiency. So these are the ones that um, you'll see in NCC 2016. Uh, it's essentially they're saying that your building, depending on it, will be energy efficient, energy efficient to the degree necessary when taking into account its location, its use, its form, its function, uh, the internal environment, the, the behaviour of the occupants and so forth. So what's changed in 2019? There's two key changes. Firstly, we've replaced two of those qualitative statements, one which is to do with the internal environment and one which is to do with uh, uh, airspeed, uh, with human comfort. So the intent what was, with, of that, what we're really saying is a building should be energy efficient, but not to the detriment of the occupant's comfort. Secondly, we've introduced a quantified hourly regulated energy component to it. So these numbers have been set, for example, in a class six building, a retail of 80 kilojoules per square meter per hour, for a class five, 43 kilojoules per square meter per hour, or a class two building at 15 kilojoules per square meter per hour. Now these numbers have been set intentionally very stringently, uh, but they allow the possibility of demonstrating compliance with J1 at a whole of building level if your building meets these quantified performance targets that we've introduced to the code, and you can show you're meeting the intent of the qualified statements. Now, we're not expecting that there will be a lot of people who choose this compliance pathway. So essentially it would be a, a detailed energy modelling approach and we, have, we do have materials that um, you can draw upon around that. Uh, but it is a compliance pathway. Uh, it, it always has been a compliance pathway just to do a pure performance solution to show compliance with performance requirements in any aspect of the code. Um, but most people choose to use um, the deemed to satisfy our verification method. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind though is just because we have a quantified uh, target now within the performance requirement doesn't mean that either the deemed to satisfy approach or the performance solution approach remains uh, um, become, becomes invalid. They remain valid pathways for showing compliance. Uh, the, the way that the code is structured is that if you follow the DTS pathway or the prescriptive approaches in JV3, JV1, they're deemed to be equivalent with the performance requirement, even if your overall building doesn't hit that that. Uh, kilojoules per square metre per hour target. Essentially, they're all ways of saying that the building overall is energy efficient. Okay. Just a little bit on the structure of the code. Okay. That's all from me for now. You, I'll be coming back to talk about JB3 later on. Um, I'd like to hand over to, to Erica to talk about the deemed to satisfy provisions for facades and services. Um, thanks very much for your time today. I hope to get a chance to talk to you further today. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike, and good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many people here this morning to hear about Section J, and I think we can see that when Sydney siders say they're going to show up, they actually do. So <laughs> it's a great audience here this morning. So just a little bit of orientation to start with before I take a deep dive into the deemed to satisfy provisions, especially those around the facade. 
Um, because for those of you who aren't immersed every day in Section J, it can feel a bit like you're maybe drowning in a sea of alphabet soup where everything starts with J. We've got J's, J0s, JP's, JV's and J's. So what I'm going to be talking about for the next half hour, as Mike has said, is the deemed to satisfy provisions which is parts J0 to J8 of the code. Those are the cookbook approach to, building a to creating a building that just complies with section J. Of course, that does, as Mike has said, also feed into the performance solution because you can use the deem to satisfy to define the benchmark building for either JV3 or for your Green Star simulation, which we'll hear more about later. So that's the orientation. Now it's time to spend a bit of time looking at the details of what's happening in those stem to satisfy parts of the code. So starting out with the building fabric provisions, J1 to J3. So actually, I'm gonna start out looking at J1 and we've had two big changes and one thing that kind of stays the same. So the first of the big changes is that whereas previously in NCC 2016, we separately looked at the opaque part of the fabric in section in part J1 and the glazing in part J2, we now combine those together and look at them together in the new part J1 for 2019. That creates some extra flexibility for designers because now if you need to improve something to comply, you can either improve your opaque parts or your windows. Um, you have a choice about how to do that to create an overall design that is compliant. So improved flexibility is actually going to be one of the themes of my talk today. So that's the first big thing that's changed. The second big change is that whereas in NCC 2016, you had to look at each aspect individually and make sure that each aspect individually complied, especially this is in regards to part J2 when you were looking at the glazing, you now have the option to look at all of the aspects together. So we, you can still look at each aspect individually and we call that um, method one. You can still do that, but if you like, you can also, um, or you can alternatively choose to look at all the aspects together. So that um, also creates extra flexibility. It means that you can trade off different facades against each other. So you can have one facade which is maybe slightly underperforming, so long as you have another facade that's slightly overperforming. So that um, should help people to stay within the deemed to satisfy pathway. Um, more often and possibly means that there might be less use of the JV3 performance solution. The other thing that that should do is that it should allow you to possibly use more consistent products across your different aspects. So you may not end up with a situation that we used to have where buildings had 50 shades of grey or at least two or three shades of grey on the different aspects. So I'll be talking, that, that applies whether you're looking at at either the U-value requirement or the solar admittance requirement. So I'll talk about that more in the next few minutes. So that's the two big things that have changed. The thing that's kind of stayed the same is that we have different levels of stringency depending on how the building's likely to be used or actually depending on the classification of the building. So for buildings that are likely to run long hours, we have a higher level of stringency and that applies both to the U-value requirements and to the solar admittance requirements. So that applies to buildings like hotels, hospital wards, aged care and so on. We have a tougher level of stringency there because in those buildings that operate really long hours, of course, the energy consumption in that building is more likely to be determined by the, the outside conditions. Um, and then we have a, a, a lower level of stringency for, for daytime use buildings. For all types of buildings though, um, whether it's a classification of building that's likely to run overnight or whether it's a classification of building that's likely to just run during the day, um, you will generally find that, is, that it's the solar admittance criteria that's the sort of the <coughs> limiting value or the limiting feature um, when you're following the DEM to satisfy provisions. That'll be the limiting feature rather than the U, the U value characteristic. And that reflects that in Australian buildings, 
um, practically everywhere in Australia. It's this, for commercial buildings, it's the solar gains that are driving your energy consumption in the building. So it's the solar admittance criteria that's going to be the critical one when you're trying to design a building that complies. So I'm going to go through both the, the U-value um, criteria and the solar admittance criteria now in the next few minutes. So we'll start out with U-values, even though, as I just said, this is actually a bit less important um, here in Australia, but of course we've still got some, some criteria that you, that, you, that you need to follow if you're using the DEM to satisfy pathway. So just to look at what those are, um, for most buildings in most climate zones, there's a requirement to achieve a U value of two. So this U value is assessed on an area weighted average based on the thermal conductance through both the glazed and the opaque elements of the facade. So that U of two, it's the combined effect of both your windows and your walls. Um, however, as I have said, we do have some tighter requirements for some building, type, building classifications, those ones that are likely to be used overnight. So we go <coughs> down as low as a U of 0 0.9, which means less, less conduction for a building, um, an overnight, uh, a building that's likely to operate overnight in climate zone eight. So um, that's the, as I said, the overall value, so combining both the glazing and the opaque walls. We do also have a minimum requirement for your opaque wall elements, and this is a minimum R value. We call this our <coughs> backstop R. So just for the benefit of people here who haven't come from a technical background, the R value is kind of the opposite of U value. The R value looks at how much resistance the building is put up, putting up to the heat flow through um, the facade, whereas the U value is looking at how much heat is conducted through the facade. So the R value is the inverse of the U value, and a higher R value is better, whereas a lower U value is better. So um, for the opaque wall elements, we have a minimum R value of one in buildings that are moderately to highly glazed and a higher or more stringent minimum R value of 1.4 to 3.8 for buildings where there's a low window to wall ratio. So those tougher R values in um, buildings with lower window to wall ratios reflect the fact that obviously the opaque wall is having a more um, bigger share of the impact in those buildings with a lower window to wall ratio. And it also reflects the fact that it is actually easier to build a better insulated um, type of opaque wall construction in a building with a really low window to wall ratio, in particular where you don't have spandrels. And so I guess when you look at these um, minimum wall R value backstops, your first thought might be, and my first thought was, well, they don't look really hard at all. Like for a lot of climate zones under NCC 2016, we had a wall R requirement of 2.8, whereas here we've got a requirement of one for lots of buildings in lots of climate zones. So that kind of looks easy. But as I said, um, it can be hard to achieve, especially if you have spandrels. It can be hard to get to an R value of one without having a thermal break. And the the big thing that has changed is that we are now saying explicitly in NCC 2019 that you must cal um, calculate the effect of thermal bridging when you're calculating the R value. <coughs> so that's why these values that look a little bit easy actually aren't because we're now saying you have to account for thermal bridging and that can make a really big difference when you... Yes, okay, so Mike's just pointing out to me. Um, it was actually a requirement in NCC 2016 to calculate thermal bridging as well. However, that requirement wasn't stated explicitly in the code. Um, now it is stated explicitly in the code and because it previously wasn't explicit, it was frequently overlooked and it frequently wasn't done. Whereas now, because we've been explicit about it, you have to do it. And we've actually created some tools to help you with that, which I'm going to be talking about more later. So. Just because not everybody here is familiar with thermal bridging, because as I just said, it hasn't always been done, even though it probably should have, I'm just gonna briefly outline the concept for you. 
So in this um, uh, chart here, you can, well, in this figure here, you can see a, a few different types of thermal bridges in the structure. So the thermal bridge is an area where there's local, um, there's a locally high heat conductance, and basically it means you're bypassing the insulation. So in this picture, there are actually um, three thermal bridges, even though there's only arrows pointing to two. So firstly, we have the insulation bats. Um, that are being bypassed by the steel frame. Secondly, we have the um, sort of fastenings or, or brick ties there that are bypassing that blue layer of continuous insulation that you can see near the outside of the construction. And thirdly, there's the, the slab itself, which is projecting out to the edge of the construction. So there's three types of thermal bridges here. And what, um, just as, a, as an aside, if any of you is looking at this picture and thinking, wow, that looks really well insulated. We don't really build buildings like that here in Australia. I must admit, um, if you can read the fine print, this graphic is actually from Canada. So that's probably a place where you can't get away um, at all with, with um, ignoring thermal bridging. But here in Australia now, what we're saying in the code explicitly is that you must calculate the impact of thermal bridges when you're calculating R values or U values and that you do that using ASNZS 4859.2-2018, and that Australian standard in turn references New Zealand standard 4214. And what it tells you to, how to do is how to calculate the impact of the thermal bridges due to the, the frame elements that um, might be bridging the insulation. And the way that it does that is that it basically takes the bridged layers in the structure. So in this structure, that would be the bulk insulation, which is bridged, and any adjacent air gap. And it says that in those bridged layers, there's sort of two alternative heat paths. One is through the insulation and the other one is the bridge itself. Um, so the method considers both the thermal resistance of those heat paths, which is what's shown in this picture, and it also considers the relative area of those two different heat paths. Um, and in this example, you can see the impact of the thermal bridging. Um, if you just add up the R values of each layer in that construction sequentially, you get to an R value of 2.58. Um, whereas if you take into account the bridging of the insulation, you get to an R value of 1.0. So that's, you can see, 60% derating. So it, it really matters. So that's basically everything that I've got to say about calculating U values and R values for the moment. But we will, um, as I said, we've created a tool to help you, which is a calculator. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But before I do that. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the, um, the solar admittance criteria. And as I said earlier, for most um, buildings, this is going to be the, most, the, the item which is really going to drive your design or limit your design. So similar to the U-value calculation, you can um, look at each aspect of the facade individually, which is method one, or you can look at all aspects of the facade together at the same time in a kind of area-weighted area way, which is method two. So just looking at what method one is, when you're calculating the solar admittance, you consider the, um, the wall to glazing area, you consider the solar heat gain coefficient of your glass, and you would adjust that for any shading that's applied. And then you'll come up with a solar admittance figure, basically by multiplying those things together. Um, and you can compare that to the limiting value that's set in the code. And if you're following method one, you do that individually for each orientation, so north, south, east, and west. If you're following method two, what you do is that you use the solar admittance values that you've calculated for each aspect individually and you apply a weighting depending on um, how important that is, um, depending on which direction it's facing. And you use that to come up with an air conditioning energy value, which you can then compare to the, the one 
that just just complies based on deemed to satisfy. So if your proposed building has a lower air conditioning energy value, then you've complied. So with this with this aspect. So I should just point out something that is potentially confusing here in relation to the terminologies, just to make sure that nobody is confused. When we're talking about the air conditioning energy value, it is purely calculated from the geometry of the building. So as I've said, the window to wall area, the solar heat gain coefficient, the shading adjustment and, and so on. Um, there's no actual requirement to simulate the building to estimate its air conditioning energy consumption and you're certainly not measuring the air conditioning energy consumption. So we call it that, but it is just a geometric value. So that's method two, which is considering all of the aspects together. So when we were talking about U values, I did actually put up a slide which showed how the minimum, how, how the maximum U values looked. Um, so I've got a little slide here and it's pretty much a bit difficult to, to take in all these numbers, but this shows you how the solar admittance values look just for method one. Um, so the main thing to note here is that there are two tables. Um, the top one is relating to the classifications of building that are most likely to be used uh, during the daytime. And um, the bottom table is relating to buildings that are likely to be used overnight. And as I've said, earlier, um, in general, all of the stringencies are, are higher or tougher for those buildings that are likely to be operating for, for long hour, longer hours. So um, we have lower solar admittance values in those cases. So that's basically everything about solar admittance. But um, just before I finish talking about, well, before I go on to show you the, the calculator tool that we've made, um, I did actually want to mention retail display glazing. So just as you had, as you could with NCC 2016, you could treat retail display glazing separately from the rest of the glazing in the building. And that's still true in NCC 2019. So we do have some, I guess, more relaxed requirements um, for the retail display glazing. However, one um, thing that has been clarified in NCC 2019 is in relation to the treatment of cafes and restaurants. So what we're now clearly saying is that cafes and re restaurants don't get any kind of special dispensation for having retail display glazing. Um, so if you have a clothes shop like the one in the picture, that, that's fine. You can use the more relaxed values. But if you have a cafe or restaurant, you have to use the same approach that we talked about earlier this morning with the rest of the facade. So actually it can be a little bit difficult to know whether a tenancy is going to be um, a cafe or a restaurant or some other kind of retail. Um, I guess that's gonna be up to your professional judgment to determine that. But what we do suggest is that if there's provision for a kitchen makeup pair, a kitchen exhaust system, that's an indication that the, cafe, that the tenancy um, can be used as a cafe or a retail, uh, sorry, cafe or restaurant, I should say. Um, so in that case, if it's going to be a cafe or a restaurant, it doesn't get the um, special dispensation for retail display glazing. Okay, so, and just before we finish looking at section J1, I wanted to briefly talk about roofs and floors and go through what the main changes were there. So um, for roofs, the solar absorptance criteria is now limited to 0.45, so that should see some more light-coloured roofs. For roof lights, there's been some simplifications. Um, so previously there was five area-weighted categories, now we're just looking at two. And for floors, while we do have the same total R value requirement, regardless of whether the floor is a suspended floor or a slab on ground, the code does say that you must take into account the insulating effect of the subfloor airspace or of the soil under the floor. And of course, um, you use a different approach to that depending on whether it's a suspended floor or a slab on grade. So the code tells you um, what the insulating effect is of those, of those items in specification J1.6, or you can use section 3.5 of SIBSI guide A um, to take into account the input impact of the subfloor space or the soil. So that's 
pretty much everything I'm going to say about part J1. However, as I promised, we have made a tool to, um, to, help, to help you with this, and I'm going to briefly take you through this, this facade calculator now. So, um, before we have a look at a preview of the facade calculator, I just want to talk briefly about why you would use it. Well, the first thing is basically it makes your life a lot easier. You can use it to calculate the total system U value, so that's the um, area weighted U value of the glazing and the opaque elements of the construction. You can use it to do the solar admittance calculations. Um, it does take into account thermal bridging by the frame elements using the New Zealand standard 4214 and the Australian standard 4859. You can also use it to check that your total R value backstop has been met for your opaque wall elements. It's flexible, you can do either method one or method two, and you can use it as a bit of a design tool to optimise things. It also generates a summary report so that you can share what you've done with other people. And as well as um, being quite useful if you're following the deem to satisfy pathway, um, it can also help you to define your reference building if you're going to be following JV3. So just a little um, sneak peek at what that looks like. Um, for people who have already used the glazing calculator in NCC 2016, you'll see that the facade calculator is a bit different. There are actually about five screens or five tabs in the Excel spreadsheet now where you have to enter the data for your building. So as opposed to the glazing calculator, I think everything was entered in the one tab. Um, so that does seem a bit more complicated, but actually this calculator is doing more for you than what the glazing calculator was in NCC 2016. And to make um, life a little bit easier, we do have a library. Um, so you can use that library to store constructions that you've defined and you can um, use that for other projects so that you don't have to re-enter the same data every time. There's also some defaults in that library. So default um, glazing, default windows, default constructions. Um, and that is a good place to get started if you're just playing around. So just a little example of how the facade calculator looks. Um, and we'll see in the example the way thermal bridging is calculated. We'll see that opaque wall backstop. And we'll have a look at both method one and method two. And this example is going to be published by the ABCB at the same time that the facade calculator is released. So um, the details are all in that um, published um, case study, but if you're looking to, to find that case study, it's the Class 3 Student Accommodation Building in Melbourne, and this, as I said, will be released at the same time that the facade calculator is released, and that is going to be um, very soon, basically. It hasn't been released yet, but it, it will be soon. So, um, just looking at how, how the process works. So as I've said, there's a number of screens. The first one enters general information about the building, including the building classification and the climate zone, because the building classification and the climate zone are important in determining the stringencies. So you enter them here. Once you've done that, you enter some information about the glazing systems. So you have to enter the type of window, that is the mechanism, glass type and frame type. Um, it's interesting to note that um, you have to enter both the system total U value and solar heat gain coefficient for the window, as well as the glass U value and, and solar heat gain coefficient. So both of those items get entered. And probably a big, big thing to note here is that when you're entering the window um, total system U value and solar heat gain coefficient, it's actually asking for the methodology by which that was calculated. So it's not like the previous glazing calculator where you can just pull a number out of the air, though I'm sure you should not have been doing that. But um, you, you do have to identify the methodology here. So there's a bit more uh, accountability around that because that is shown in the report um, that the tool generates. So the methodology is um, based on a drop down list. You can either enter the AFRC true module size um, for the window that's been specified, or you can enter the, the WERS label um, based on default um, module size. So it's important um, if you're using this to support a compliance process that 
what you're entering does reflect the actual module size of the windows that have been specified. So that's the glazing. Once you've entered the glazing, there's um, a chance to enter information on walls and we've got this nifty builder wall tool where you can enter each layer um, sequentially. Um, it does ask whether the frame is made out of, well, you can, you can either enter a timber frame or a metal frame and then the, the calculator will take into account the thermal bridging um, based on some basic information about that frame. Once you've done that, um, the, the calculator will cal calculate the opaque wall system R value. You can see in this example that that, that is 2.85, which is above the backstop, so that's good. We can, we can proceed. We haven't fallen at the first hurdle this time, so let's go on. Once you've entered the walls and the windows, you just need to enter some information on the areas. Um, I should actually just say that there is um, also a separate tab where you enter some information on shading, but I haven't shown you that here today because in the first instance, this case study building doesn't have any external shading. So we enter some very um, simple information on the, the areas of the, the walls and the windows. And then we've got everything that we need to calculate the results. So as I said, the calculator does that using both method one and method two. In this first instance, actually we didn't quite get there in method one or method two. So you can see that we've gone over our U-value limits in every aspect. We've gone over our um, solar admittance limits in every aspect. Um, and in method two, we, we also don't comply. So in this example, we did some um, optimising and we changed the frame from an aluminium framed window to a UPVC frame window and we added um, shades to the fixed windows. So sorry, that bit on shutters, they're not insulated shutters, it's just shades on the windows, vertical shade devices. Um, and by making those changes, we, di we did see um, that all of a sudden our building um, now complies with part J1 um, using well, the, ca the calculators indicating that the, the, the facade elements are likely to comply with part J1 here. So um, you can see though, interestingly, that we haven't complied using method one because our south facade is still not quite good enough. We're still going over the solar admittance limit on the south facade. Um, however, we have complied on method two and that's okay because you don't need to be both method one and method two. You only need to be okay on one or the other. So we've gone a bit worse on the south facade, but because our other aspects are going a bit better, we're okay with method two. We got there. So that's... Um, that's the case study. And the only other thing to highlight is that, as I said, you can use the calculator, even if you're following JV3, to define your reference building. So your reference building is basically your building that has the same geometry as your proposed building, but only just complies with the DTS. And you have the option to do that either um, without shading or with shading. And it will just, um, depending on whether you select with or without shading, it will adjust the other parameters to give you a building that only just complies. So that's basically everything I've got to say about facades. So just summarising now, um, we have, we've had two big changes. So the first thing is that the opaque facade elements and the glazing, whereas they were separately um, assessed in parts J1 and J2 before, are now <coughs> all assessed together in part J1. Second big change is that we can either look at each aspect individually or we can look at the combined impact of all of the aspects together in method two. We do still have different stringency settings based on the class of the building um, and obviously based on the location of the building. We've clarified the treatment of thermal bridging, so now it's really clear that you do have to take it into account and we've provided a facade calculator tool that does that for you, amongst other things, um, calculates the impact of the thermal bridging. So that's the end of facades almost. Um, but just to briefly talk about building ceiling. Um, okay, we're back. Um, there has been a change made to, to, to say that rapid roller doors are now required 
um, where there's a loading dock that opens to a conditioned area in the building. So that's the, the big change there in regards to building ceiling. So now I'm going to be talking about the services for a little while. And um, I've got a pretty high level presentation of what's happening with the services, but I just wanted to highlight that for those of you who are um, services engineers, there is some more detailed um, material that's going to be presented very shortly. So the Illuminating Engineering Society are running a seminar here in Sydney tomorrow night. So if anyone's interested in lighting design in particular and the um, way that the changes in Section J are impacting there, come along to the seminar tomorrow night. You can um, sign up th for that through the IES website. And for those of you who are on the mechanical side, ERA will be running a Section J seminar in Sydney on the 12th of June and you can sign up to that through the ERA website. <laughs> So just to give you an overview though of what the main changes are, and I'll start out with mechanical. So in part J5, um, generally there's been a lot of stringency increases, um, and that is actually reflecting the fact that there's been a lot of technological change over the last 10 years and that the market's moved on. Um, so really the code is catching up to where the market's at. So for boilers, um, the stringency has now been set such that it, al it aligns with um, the specification of condensing boilers um, in all ap applications. So that's the, the big change there. Um, for chillers, <coughs> chillers and pack units, the stringency has also been increased there. Um, it now aligns with MEPS. So whereas previously what was specified in the M in NCC was worse than where MEPS at and it was basically giving a kind of a free kick to people who were using the JV3 method, um, so that's been tightened up considerably. For heat rejection systems, um, we've changed the way that we're, we're specifying the efficiency as well as changing the efficiency criteria themselves. So whereas previously the efficiency was um, specified in terms of the fan um, kilowatts per litre per second. It's now specified in terms of the um, fan, sorry, fan watts per litres per second, I should say. It's now specified in terms of the fan watts per kilowatt of heat that's rejected. So that's a more sensible way of doing it. Um, similarly, for economy cycles, we're now, state, we're now specifying whether or not you need an economy cycle um, based on the airflow um, through, through the system rather than on the refrigeration capacity of that air conditioning system. And for outside air, there's um, actually been some, some changes there so that in most um, buildings, in most climate zones, you'll actually need to have either a modulation arrangement so that if your outside, so that if your building's not occupied to its design level, you can turn down the outside air volume or there'll need to be a heat recovery system in place. So those are, um, the, that's the high level on part J5. There's also been some changes to fans and pumps. So um, firstly, we're changing the whole philosophy of how we set those efficiency levels. So um, previously it was set in terms of, it was specified in terms of watts per meter squared of area being served. We considered that that was a bit unfair because um, the building geometry can have a big influence on where you can get to in terms of watts per metre squared and that's out of the control of the air conditioning designer. So that was unfair. Also, depending on whether you went with an air-based or a water-based system where air or water was your main fluid for distributing heat through the building, you would end up with um, a target that was either too easy or too hard. So we've moved away from the watts per metre squared figure and we've now um, set some criteria for basically each element of your air distribution system and your water distribution system. So for example, with fans, there's an efficiency requirement based on the um, system pressure and the fan motor size. Um, there's um, efficiency, there's a pressure drop requirement um, that's been specified for each element of your distribution system um, and there's a le limit on the amount of flexible duct that you're allowed to have which is just limited to six metres. Um, 
Similarly, for pumps or for water distribution systems, there's an efficiency criteria for the pump itself, which is aligning with Europe European minimum standards. And then we have a pressure, pressure drop criteria um, for each element of the water distribution system. So just the same as with the facades though, we've actually also taken the, the approach of saying, you can assess each of those elements individually. Um, so this is a really good analogy for breakfast time. You can look at whether all of the ingredients of your favorite <laughs> breakfast are up to standard and whether every single one of those complies by itself, or you can look at the whole breakfast together and say, is it just as tasty? So <laughs> you can have, um, basically a little bit of trading off happening. Some parts of your system may be being a little bit worse, some parts of your system may be being a little bit better. Um, it's, it's very similar to what we're doing with the facades on the different aspects there. And again, it may mean um, more um, ability to stay within the JV3, or sorry, to stay within the DTS pathway um, for more buildings. Um, however, we did also have a little bit of feedback um, that the, the fan efficiency methodology in particular was a little bit difficult to use um, in the DTS. So um, in the DTS, the requirement for fan efficiency varies depending on whether you're above, whether your, your system pressure drop is above 200 pascals or below 200 pascals, you have a different approach basically and um, your efficiency requirements also depending on the fan motor kilowatts so that ABCB has worked with the Fan Manufacturers Association of Australia and New Zealand to develop this um, alternative which is a performance based design solution um, this will be published very soon um, this can be applied right across the entire pressure range um, as, a, as an alternative way of de determining your fan efficiency requirement. So, um, so that's everything on mechanical. Um, you can hear more about that at the AERA seminar on the 12th of June. Now quickly looking at lighting. So just the same as mechanical, we have had some big increases in stringency here and obviously there has been a huge amount of change in the last 10 years in terms of the rollout of LEDs, meaning that lighting generally is far, far more efficient than it was. So the illumination power density limits have been decreased by roughly about 60 um, percent um, compared with what was there in NCC 2016. There's also been some um, changes to exterior lighting. If you have more than 100 watts of exterior lights, um, they do need to be specified with LEDs. So while those illumination power density limits have um, been um, tightened up a lot, um, we do still allow some adjustments um, to those based on different elements of the design that are, that are probably outside of the designer's control. So basically, um, depending on your room aspect ratio, the geometry of your room can make it harder to achieve a really low wattage lighting system. So if you have some really difficult geometry that you're dealing with, the code accommodates that and there is still a process in the code where you can adjust your illumination power density limit based on the room geometry using the room aspect ratio. We also have an adjustment based on whether any control devices are installed. So whether you have an occupancy sensor or a daylight dimming system or a lumen depreciation dimming, dimming system, all of those things can mean that your lighting system runs more efficiently than if they weren't there. And the code reflects that by giving you um, a control device adjustment, which then applies as an adjustment to your illumination power density target. Um, so the other thing that we now um, also recognise is that depending on the colour rendering index that you're trying to achieve or the colour temperature, that does also affect um, the power use of your lights. So if you're trying to achieve a very high colour rendering index or a warm white type of light, um, that does incur some extra energy use, um, but it does provide a, a particular service that you might need. So we've recognised that in the code by also allowing adjustment factors for those items. So 
that's everything about lighting. But in J6, we now also have some new things that we weren't covering before. So we were not covering lifts um, or moving walkways. And we've got some new provisions there that are really just about um, coming up to where business as usual is sitting. So for example, the um, lift car lighting and ventilation must shut down now when the lift is unused. And we have a standby energy limit based on the lift load capacity in kilos. And we have a uh, energy efficiency criteria based on how much the lift is likely to be used. And that's aligning with international standards. As I said, it should really be business as usual. And similarly for escalators and moving walkways, they should slow down um, when nobody's using them. And just quickly for pools and spas, um, Generally, the changes here in part J7 have been to align with part J5. So your pool water heater um, thermal efficiency, if it's, if it's a gas boiler, now it should also be a condensing boiler, just the same as part as, as is specified for air conditioning system boilers in part J5. Um, the pipework insulation for a pool or spa also um, must meet the same requirements that are specified in part J5. Um, and there's a requirement now for pool covers to have a minimum R value. Um, so that's, that is also a new item. And the other thing that we've done is that we've removed the restriction that we previously had where solar heaters for pools were not allowed to be electric boosted. So that's, that's been removed and it's um, similar to what Mike said earlier when we got rid of JP3. It's not as simple as gas is good, electricity is bad anymore. So that, that's why that requirement's been removed. And finally, for part J8, um, there's a requirement now for time of use metering data to feed back to the central monit monitoring system. Um, this will hopefully allow building managers to check that their building is actually performing at the level intended and to, and to track the energy use of the building. So just wrapping up um, for services, the fans, pumps, boilers, chillers and lighting stringency levels have all been increased quite significantly but this is really reflecting where the market's gone in the last 10 years um, and aligning now with, with where the market's at. Um, we have changed the way that fan and pump system systems are assessed in part J5 quite significantly. Um, but we're now, we've now got the flexibility so that you can either look at each aspect of the system individually or you can choose to look at all aspects of a system together to see whether you've met um, your overall efficient, whether you've met your efficiency requirements. So allow, allowing some trading off there within, within a system. Um, we have improved the lighting target, uh, sorry, we've improved the lighting stringency levels, but we still allow you to adjust for that based on your room geometry, based on your control devices, and um, based on the service quality you're achieving in terms of the colour rendering index and the colour temperature. And now for the first time ever, the code is regulating lifts and moving walkways. So that's actually the end of my presentation. We're going the whole way through here. I hope you're feeling energised and refreshed and not too overwhelmed um, at this point. This is where we are. So we've, uh, we've just heard all there is to know about DTS. We're now moving on to hear a bit more about the verification methods that are available in NCC 2019. So we're going to first hear from Monique Alfres from Neighbours uh, on the Neighbours method, JV1, and then Taryn Cornell from the GBCA on uh, Green Star Method JV2, and then Mike will make another encore appearance at the end, and he's going to talk us through changes to JV3 and the introduction of a new um, post-construction verification method for building ceiling JV4. So I'd just like to introduce to you, I guess, our next speakers. Um, Monique is the acting head of technical standards at Neighbours. Uh, she's probably well known to most of you. Um, Monique has worked on delivering the Neighbours co-assess um, rating tool, a new application process for office buildings. She's also worked on the expansion of Neighbours for shopping centres tools um, to centres smaller than 15,000 square metres. And she's also worked on the Neighbours for apartment buildings tool. 
Uh, Taryn Cornell's role at the GBCA focuses on the development and innovation of the Green Star rating tools, ensuring they're aligned with industry needs and standards. Having worked for over a decade in interior and architectural design, Taryn has a detailed knowledge and considered approach to design, project delivery, and stakeholder engagement. Please join me in first welcoming Monique, then Taryn. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today to tell you a little bit about uh, JV1, uh, one of the new methods in the building code um, for the use of neighbours. Um, firstly, I just want to say that I think that this is a really great um, update to the building code overall. I mean, it's one of the biggest changes that we've seen um, over the last decade of the building code being in place. Um, I just wanted to give kudos to um, the ABCB for all the great work that they've done in this update. And it's really bringing Australia to um, in line with other countries around the world that have also made big improvements in the um, energy efficiency components of their building code. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to start off with another little poll, um, which is how many of you know about Neighbours, have heard about Neighbours in some way? And leave your hands up if you have quite a good understanding of Neighbours. Okay, so a few of you left in the room. So just to quickly start off with, Neighbours uh, provides a language for sustainability, where basically a rating scheme for the environmental performance of your building. So we do tend to focus on that performance side of how buildings are actually operating. When benchmarks are set, the average building is set at the three star level. Uh, the six star level is the market leading end of the scale and that usually equates to about a 75 to 80% reduction in energy consumption compared to the average building. A uh, one star building is down at the other end of the scale. There's a lot of opportunity for improvement with buildings down this end of the scale and they are using um, 75 to 80% more energy than the average building. We do provide zero star ratings as well. As Paul Bannister often says to me, we have zero stars because there's no limit to how bad buildings can be. Um, so we have that, that, that sort of different series of the scale. Um, what we've actually seen in Australia is that we, um, which I'm going to go into in a moment, is that whilst um, three stars was the average when the benchmarks were set, it is no longer the average um, for um, buildings in the office sector. Uh, Sectors currently covered by neighbours are quite a few. Um, as Frankie mentioned, I worked on the apartment buildings and shopping centres expansion, but we do also have rating tools for data centres, public hospitals and hotels. I mention all of these because um, later this year we are going to be expanding our commitment agreements program into other sectors that we cover as well. So there is the opportunity for the um, the neighbours method to be used um, in the building code for other building sectors, not just offices, but for the moment it is just the offices sector. So we've been uh, around for about 20 years and in that time we have seen a massive growth in the Neighbours program. So this slide is basically showing you um, that we, are seeing, we have seen a really large uptake in the number of buildings across Australia that are getting Neighbours ratings. We're seeing penetration of about 85 to 90% of office building, base buildings across Australia getting ratings. And for buildings that have participated in our program um, over 10 years, we have seen the average building um, reduce their energy intensity by about 40%, which is a pretty incredible result. It's actually the fastest rate of reduction that we've seen globally for any sector. So, and this isn't just the best buildings, it's not the worst buildings, it's the average building that's participating in the neighbours scheme. The reason that I'm telling you this is because what it, this relates to what I was saying about the average building. We have really seen buildings push up into that 5.5 star and 6 star rated categories in the last few years. Um, this graph is showing you the number of ratings that we're seeing in both of those categories. And particularly we're seeing this push into the 6 star, which is the, those purple bars in the last two or three years. And what the industry is telling us is that it is possible to achieve those ratings today um, with cost-effective technology. And really um, the, the way that these buildings are being delivered now is about making sure that they are being constructed well and then that they're being operated well, not by using fancy technologies that may seem like technologies of the future, which I think makes the, uh, the benchmark that the ABCB has set at 5.5 stars quite a reasonable one in terms of what we're hearing and where we're seeing ratings pushing to. Okay, so now while, why we're all here, um, 
Oh, sorry. And just on that as well, there were a few questions in some of the other forums about whether these are ratings with green power. These are actually ratings without green power. So these are the ratings that are purely based on the energy efficiency operation of the buildings, just to make that clear. So yes, while we're all here, um, which is the JV1 Neighbours Method, which actually uses a product that we have in the Neighbours Program called Commitment Agreements, which I'm going to go into in a little bit more detail. Commitment Agreements is a product that takes buildings all the way from design through to operation. Uh, it actually ties the performance of your design, uh, sorry, your design to the um, operation of your building through a contractual agreement um, with uh, the Office of Environment and Heritage, which is where the Neighbours Program sits. The very first thing that you need to do if you want to enter into a neighbour's commitment agreement is actually to model your building as you are expecting it to operate. And the reason that we ask you to model it in that way is because we do tie you to a performance requirement at the end of this process. So if you think that your building is going to be operating for much longer hours than a normal building would operate, we ask you to design to model your building in that way because it's probably going to change the way that you design your central plant, for example example. So if you have a normal building that operates nine to five, you may design in a particular way. But if you know that you're going to have an anchor tenant that's going to be running um, in that building for much longer periods, they're going to be there seven to seven, or they're going to be there overnight for some reason because they've got international trading floors, you should model that building as you are expecting it to operate. And that is whether you go for a commitment agreement with or without the building code um, in play. The second thing that you would do is sign a, a contractual commitment agreement with the Office of Environment and Heritage. So again, a question that came up in some of the other forums was who was it that actually signs that commitment agreement? It's not the design team, um, it's not the architect, it's actually the owner of the building that needs to sign that agreement. Um, so there was some concern about whether um, commitments could be made on behalf of the owner by someone else. It can't be, it is actually the owner of the building that signs that commitment agreement with us. And what that commitment agreement is, is um, that you uh, commit to targeting a, a particular rating and that also that you uh, go, that you do after a 12 month to 24 month period actually undertake getting that certified rating as well. The next thing that you need to do after you've signed your commitment agreement contract is undertake an indep independent um, design review. So we have a panel of experts um, that we have appointed in a number of different sectors. So we have quite a few experts now um, in the office sector. And what they do is they come in and they peer review the design and the modelling. Uh, it's basically a fresh set of eyes just to see if there's anything that you may have missed or if there were things that potentially weren't considered. Uh, again, in some of the other forums, uh, people were asking if uh, you have to take the recommendations of the independent design reviewer on board. You don't. That's not a requirement of the commitment agreement. All that we ask is that you consider those recommendations um, and then, you know, outline basically why you've decided to not take them on. So it's just a fresh set of eyes coming in that has a lot of experience. Um, the people that we've chosen on our independent design review panel do have a lot of experience taking these buildings from design to construction through a, a neighbour's commitment agreement process. So they just provide um, that, extra, that extra level of review. And then of course the final step is that you um, get your neighbour's rating certified in operation to meet the level that you have committed to. So how does it work uh, when we apply it to the building code? So the first step is that you need to sign a commitment agreement with the Office of Environment and Heritage committing to a 5.5 star level. The next step that you need to do is a calculation outside of our commitment agreement process, which I'm going to go through in a little bit more detail in a moment, which is basically, um, we, we're calling it a base building services check, and those base building services must not be more than 67% of the 5.5 star level. So it sounds a little bit confusing and complicated, but I'm going to break it down. It is actually quite a simple, uh, simple calculation to do. You then need to do a thermal comfort check. I'm not going to go through that in too much detail because Mike's going to explain that part of this process a little bit later. And the same with the additional requirements. There are a few additional requirements that you need to undertake as well if you're going through the neighbours method and Mike's going to explain those in more detail. So the first step is that you need to sign a 5.5 star neighbours energy commitment agreement. That's something that you get in touch with us 
um, with and we provide you with the contract and then you sign it, quite a, a simple process. Um, the second thing that you need to do after you've signed your 5.5 Star Neighbours Energy Commitment Agreement, you would have already undertaken your modelling to make sure that um, you meet your requirement. Um, but what you need to do is basically figure out what the maximum allowance is of energy consumption that you can use and make sure that you're going to be below it. So the 5.5 star rating is actually a band. It goes from um, just hitting five stars. Obviously, if you get all the way through the band and you're at the other end, you're going to get a six star rating. What this number tells you is that if you're using slightly more than this, you're actually going to get a five star rating. So this is the maximum allowable amount for your 5.5 star rating. And that's the number that you want to try and determine. Um, when you're doing your neighbour's energy commitment agreement, very few uh, buildings will actually design to this maximum allowable amount and that's because you're committing to a performance in operation and there's all sorts of things that can happen between when you build your initial model all the way through to 12 to 24 months after operation. So usually design teams allow anywhere between 5 and 25% on this maximum allowable allowance. That depends on the risk appetite of the design team, how many any commitment agreement processes you've been through before, how confident you are of what tenants you're going to have, um, whether you're sort of quite close to the construction stage. There are many factors and we don't specify what your margin needs to be, but we do say, you know, you need to consider what your margin should be and what risks you think are going to occur throughout that process and, you know, what your sort of risk appetite is. Um, but anyway, you have this maximum allowable allowance that tells you if you go above that, you're not, no longer going to be achieving your 5.5 start rating. The next step that you need to do is take that initial figure and then do a base building services check. So you need to make sure that your base building energy uses for particular services is no more than 67% of your 5.5 star figure. So you have this maximum allowable uh, allowance and that covers many items um, for your base building energy rating. So things like your air conditioning, heating, ventilation, common area lighting, lifts, car parks, um, external lighting. So for all, the, all of those people that know and love neighbours, you will be well versed with this list. For the, um, the uh, and check that you need to do in the NCC, you actually remove some of these items because they are going to be checked again elsewhere. So for this particular check, you need to get rid of car park energy, external lighting energy and any energy associated with tenant supplementary systems. And for the rest of the items, those are the ones that can be no more than 67% of the maximum allowance. So again, just to reiterate, it's not that those other items aren't being checked, they're actually being checked elsewhere. So I'm going to go through that in a minute. For this particular check, you're only looking at these particular items, or sorry, all of the items that are not car parks, external lighting and tenant supplementary systems that would normally be covered under a neighbour's base building energy rating. And you want to make sure that they're no more than 67% of your maximum, al maximum allowance. So in this particular example, and these are just made up numbers for, um, as you can see, one, two, three example street in Sydney. In this particular example, you would want those particular services to use no more than 40 kilowatt hours per metre squared. And then you know that you're meeting your requirement under the NCC. So not too complicated a calculation that you need to do on top of your energy model, which you already would have done the calculations for, and you would have already separated out all of these particular items in your model anyway. Um, the next step, like I said, which I'm not going to go into too much detail because Mike's going to talk about it, is that you need to do a thermal comfort check. Um, we think that this is a really great addition to the NCC and it's really great um, to have this added to the commitment agreement process. Uh, we think that it adds um, r really like a, a great check to make sure that buildings aren't being run at 14 degrees in winter to achieve um, the 5.5 star rating. You won't be able to do this with, when you do the thermal comfort check as well. The last step um, is that you need to uh, meet the general requirements and there are a few additional specific JV1 requirements, which are those items that we removed previously. So the car park, um, the tenant lighting and the supplementary systems are going to be done um, through this separate check, which not Mike's going to talk about. Essentially what it's saying is make sure that these meet DTS requirements is what this is saying. 
so I, Taryn's going to go through this in more detail in a moment from what I understand, but just like Mike was saying, we're not the certifiers. Um, we're just a body that uh, provides, you know, a, you a pathway to be able to get certification. Um, so this in, this slide basically takes you through the kinds of things that your certifier is likely to want to be able to see when you're planning to use this method. So the very first thing that you would give them is evidence that you actually have undertaken um, this commitment agreement process. So what you would do is probably just copy a few relevant pages out of your commitment agreement contract and include them within your report to the building certifier. Then you would pull out um, this section showing that you have met the base building services check. So you'd probably provide them with your commitment agreement energy report and then with an extra set of calculations just showing them that you've done this check as well and it might already be included within your report. Then a section showing them how you've met your thermal comfort requirements and then finally a section addressing those additional requirements basically showing that those additional services are meeting the DTS requirements. And yeah, that's the end. I just wanted to reiterate that we are going to be launching um, the commitment agreement product in a number of other sectors, um, hotels, shopping centres and data centres later this year. So there will be the opportunity um, in the future to be able to use this method for other um, sectors of buildings. But for the moment, it is for um, office buildings that you can use this method for. Thanks very much. <laughs> Obviously, I'm also not Carlos. <laughs> Oh, yes, I'm introducing Tarek from uh, the Council. <laughs> That's me. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thanks all for being here this morning. It's great to see you're all still with us. Um, we are on the home stretch now, though, so uh, bear with us and we will get through it and get you on to the rest of your day. Um, but I also wanted to reiterate, we're really excited at the Green Building Council to be here um, as a uh, a pathway for demonstrating compliance in Section J. Um, so really a, a huge thanks to the ABCB and also to the PCA for having us here today. So I'm going to do a poll as well. Uh, who's familiar with the Green Building Council? Most of you, that's great. And what about Green Star? Excellent. Um, well, just a brief introduction for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, the GBCA, or the Green Building Council of Australia, we are a, um, a member-based organisation uh, dedicated to, to the transformation of the built environment. Um, we create market-based solutions that empower industry to embrace sustainable practices, and we've got a really strong focus on carbon emissions um, currently. We've got three primary functions, and that's to rate, to educate, and to advocate. Um, and so the Green Star rating system is our uh, is what we do uh, in terms of the rating. There are four major rating tools. Um, there are four communities, uh, design and as built, interiors and performance. These set the best practice standard for Australia. So while we've got the building code here to set the minimum practice, the Green Star is about setting best practice and beyond. The JV2 method uh, or the JV2 pathway is embedded in the design and as built rating tool, which is the rating tool for new builds and major refurbs. <coughs> so design and as built is a holistic rating tool. Uh, so in contrast to neighbours, it's not a sector specific rating tool um, or a, a sort of a carbon specific rating tool. It is about demonstrating holistic uh, sustainability measures across a number of different categories. So we've got the nine different categories up here. The energy uh, category is where you'll find the way to demonstrate your JB2 um, through greenhouse gas emissions reduction. And so we just, I guess the point here is that greenhouse gas emissions reduction is just one part of the rating tool. In order to uh, pursue JV2, you'd need to select the reference building pathway. It works in a really similar way to JV3, which is to have a NCC uh, compliant building or a, essentially just a reference building, which is based on largely on uh, DTS. You then compare that to your proposed building. But we've got a couple of extra steps in Green Star, and that is to uh, first create what's called a benchmark building. And so that benchmark building is a 10% reduction on your greenhouse gas emissions of your NCC or your reference building, your NCC compliant building. 
you then need to demonstrate that you sit somewhere on a scale between that benchmark building uh, on, a, on a scale of a zero to 100% improvement. So if you're pursuing JB2, what you need to do is be a minimum of 10% and beyond. Now it's worth noting here that obviously if you're pursuing Green Star, if you sit at that 10% improvement point, you're not going to score any points in this category and it's quite, a, it's quite a heavily weighted category in terms of points. So the ambition for projects pursuing Green Star is to sit much further than that 10%. Um, they, they typically sit somewhere between say a 40 and a 60% improvement above that 10% uh, benchmark building. We also have in Green Star an intermediate uh, building and that's a, that's a separate model that we create which uh, looks specifically at the improvement on your facade against the DTS facade provisions. It doesn't specifically relate to JB2, uh, you'll see that in a moment, but it's just an extra step that we have in Green Star as a, a way to accumulate points. So put really simply, um, the JB2 method is a way for you to demonstrate compliance with JP1 using the Green Star Design and as built modelling protocol. So under NCC 2016, what you used to have to do is create a series of modelling for your Green Star compliance, which you then put into your submission, which would contribute your, to your certification. Um, but under, uh, sorry, and then you'd also have a set of um, modelling that you would create specifically for your JB3, which you would then give to your building certifier to demonstrate compliance with Section J. Under the NCC 2019, however, you're able to use that same set of modelling protocol in, from Green Star and apply that to your uh, Section J certification. So reiterating here, the Green Building Council is not becoming a certifying authority. We will stick to what we know and love, which is Green Star, and we will leave the certification to the building certifiers. It's simply just a way to simplify the amount of documentation that's required and also um, uh, streamline the process to certification both for Green Star and for Section J. So to pursue JV2, uh, you would need to register your project for Green Star, uh, then you would create your performance solution. Um, when you register for Green Star, that is usually done by the asset owner and as I mentioned earlier, you are committing to pursuing points and, and getting an accreditation or a rating for that whole of building um, model that we have. So those nine categories that I showed before, you're looking to accumulate points across all of that. Um, but in terms of JV2, you're just demonstrating that you've committed to that. Then you would create your performance solution. You then also go on to produce your energy model and the reporting that comes out of that energy model. <coughs> And that's when this, the process splits. So you would provide that information out of that energy modelling report to your certifier. You would also put that into the calculator in Green Star and that's how you um, achieve points in your Green Star model. The JV2 performance solution itself is essentially demonstrating that you've got the greenhouse gas emissions reduction being more than 10%, so sitting somewhere above that benchmark building. You then also have to demonstrate that you've got your thermal comfort uh, check, which is your having a PMV of uh, between minus one to plus one for 95% of the time, 90%, sorry, 95% of the area, 98% of the time. Mike will talk to that a little bit further. Uh, and then you also need to demonstrate that it uh, meets the additional requirements under JVA and JVB. The modeling process itself, you would use the Green Star method, uh, the reference methodology, to create your reference building. You then obviously calculate the greenhouse gas emissions for the proposed building with its proposed services. And then you demonstrate that that proposed building is uh, at least 10% better, so sitting at that benchmark or beyond. Um, just back on that, sorry, that greenhouse gas consumption uh, and, sorry, the energy consumption greenhouse gas emissions guide, we refer to that as the calculator guide. It is available for download on our website currently. Um, a lot of you who are used to the, the Green Star methodology are probably quite familiar with it. It is going to be updated soon um, in response to Section J, so stay tuned for those updates. The documentation required for JV2. Uh, as we mentioned, you've got that one single energy modelling report that you'll rely on. You need to demonstrate that you've met the Green Star Design and As-Built Submission Guidelines and the uh, information that's in the calculator guide. Um, the Design and As-Built Submission Guidelines is basically just saying that you're using the correct pathway. So are you pursuing the uh, reference building pathway? 
Confusingly, we also recognise Neighbours Commitment Agreements in Greenstar. So if you're using JV1, you can get recognised for that in Greenstar. But if you want to pursue JV2 because you're doing energy modelling uh, specifically related to Greenstar, that's the pathway that you'll use. So hopefully that's not confusing you all too much. You need to also demonstrate that your report content meets the calculator guide requirements. Um, you would need to have a copy of the Green Star registration email, so basically demonstrating to your certifier that you have registered and committed to that Green Star commitment uh, certification. And also you would need to comply with those additional DTS requirements. The energy report content itself has the scope of the solution and the approach that you've taken. It's got an overview of the emissions and the thermal comfort modelling that you've taken. There's obviously the comparison uh, between the reference building and the proposed building for your greenhouse gas emissions, and then also a summa summary of your thermal comfort modelling, which is the PMB. Um, a fact sheet of this will be available, uh, uh, of this whole process will be available through the ABCB. I think it's yet to be published, but Mike will talk maybe a little bit further about the reference materials available to you. Finally, uh, Green Star Design and As Built. So we have a version 1.3 that will be released specifically to respond to the changes that are happening in Section J. So um, it's going to come out in mid-June. It is only for projects that are using NCC 2019 and beyond. Okay, so a few things that have changed. Uh, we have added some additional prescriptive measures to that reference building pathway. They, are, they have nothing to do specifically with JV2. However, um, because we recognise that that reference building under NCC 2016 is uh, substantially more difficult under 2019, um, we are allowing projects to pursue initiati additional initiatives to gain additional points. Uh, and that's also pointing us in the direction towards the future focus rating tool, which is a, a wholesale upgrade of, of design and as built and the rating tool system. Uh, so it's, it's indicating the direction that we see the rating tool going. Uh, we've also increased points for use of green power. So we're really trying to encourage projects to pursue the use of green power. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got some minor updates to the calculator guide. Now, those are in relation to the, um, the assessment methods that um, have been outlined in the DTS provisions and a few other things just, just to tighten up in, in respect to how the, the code has changed and the way in which the code has changed. We've also got innovation points for early adoption of NCC uh, 2019. So if you are committing to using uh, the NCC Section J before the end of that transition phase, then we will reward you with innovation points. We've also, we're also looking at a change in improvement for that intermediate building itself. So the intermediate building currently um, has a scale of zero to 20% improvement and we're looking at changing that just in respect to the fact that the, the way in which the facade is calculated and the changes to the facade have dramatically increased and improved under Section J 2019. What stays the same? We have uh, the modelling framework and the scale for improvement on the actual reference building. That all stays the same. And also the documentation requirements and the certification process. So I suppose what I'm saying here is that largely that reference building pathway is staying primarily quite similar. Um, we are just teasing around the edges and that is all happening in response to the great stuff that is happening in Section J. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to hand back to Mike now. Thank you, Taryn. So I'm going to talk briefly. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the, the session now, just on the, the main changes to JV3, verification using a reference building. And I'll also touch briefly on the introduction of a blower door test verification method to show uh, compliance with uh, the building ceiling requirements of Section J. I guess the main thing about the changes we've made to JV3 is that the overall structure of creating a reference building based on the deemed to satisfy provisions, the, the cookbook building, and comparing your proposed building to that and showing that it's, it's more efficient uh, remains the same within JV3. So just maybe a quick show of hands, how many of you are using JV3 commonly in your... Uh, that's a fair few the people here, so it'd be familiar. So the general structure of how you use JV3 is unchanged. And what's also unchanged is 
you can use DB3 to show compliance just for your facade elements, as is commonly done uh, at design approval, and then say well, services will comply with DTS. Or you can use DB3 for both facade and services. So the general structure is the same, but there are a few key points of difference that uh, from 2016 to 2019 that I'll go through now. So the first key point of difference is that the point of comparison has changed to greenhouse gas emissions. So previously it was an energy comparison between reference and proposed. Now it's a greenhouse uh, comparison. Uh, we've done this one because it aligns uh, better with the objective of Section J, which is, if you remember right back to the start, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It also allows a better, better reconciliation between on, uh, uh, use of gas and electricity within your building. And it aligns also with uh, neighbours and green stuff. So that's big change number one. Big change number two is the change to how we define the offset you get for the use of renewable energy on site. So when we were undertaking our consultation around Section J, uh, concerns were raised with us around the use of on-site renewable energy generation to offset the performance of your proposed building so that overall it was more uh, efficient than the reference building. Uh, the concern raised was that this was being used to justify poor performing facades within, uh, within construction. Uh, what we've done is changed the definition or made it more explicit that you can only get the credit for renewable energy which is generated and used on site as part of your offset. So energy which is exported to the grid can no longer be counted to decrease the, the energy consumption your, of your proposed building. And we think that with a combination of the increase in the uh, DTS services uh, and the, uh, an, uh, the increase in the DTS facade mean that there, the risk of a, a building being able to use purely renewable energy to offset its, uh, I guess, uh, facade performance is going to be very, very small. Uh, and the other thing that is, um, is guarding against that is the introduction of the, of the comfort requirement, which I'll, I'll go into in a bit more detail in a sec. Um, we are interested in keeping an eye on this, though, going forward. Uh, Recognise that uh, on-site renewable energy is one of the most cost-effective ways of reducing greenhouse gas emissions within the building. So we do want to retain a pathway for its use within buildings, but we want to make sure we're get, getting the balance right. Okay, so the, the comfort requirement. So this is one of the big changes to Section J. It's, it's consistent across J1, J2 and J3. And essentially it's based around the predicted mean vote framework, which is outlined in uh, ASHRAE. 55. So essentially there's six factors within uh, the predicted mean vote framework. Four of those are the things that you would be using as part of your energy model or they're either inputs or outputs of your energy model and those are things like humidity, uh, radiant temperature, air temperature and airspeed are all things that are going to be either inputs or outputs of your uh, energy model that you have to do for JV3 or JV1 or JV2 and then you'll set, specify metabolic rate and and, and clothing level. So these are, again, they're outlined in ASHRAE 55 about the choices you make around that, and they should be consistent with the expected use of the building. So if it is a hospital and you've got lots of people running around in scrubs and, and being very, very active, then you will set your uh, clothing levels and metabolic rate to be consistent with that. If it's a, an office building where you've got very, very important men in suits or very, very important women in suits, then you would set your clothing level appropriately. There's guidelines within uh, ASHRAE 55 about how you should do that and you should follow that process. Again, this guards against poor performing facades. Uh, the use of renewable energy on site to create a building which is, is purely part, uh, yeah, if you have a paper thin facade and renewable energy, you're not going to meet your comfort requirements going forward. So essentially this is again is to meet that performance requirement that we have in place which is uh, buildings need to be energy efficient but not at the expense of human comfort. Buildings are designed for the people within them. Okay. Uh, just a bit further on comfort, we recognise that uh, PMV is not the best me measure necessarily if you have a mixed mode or naturally ventilated building uh, and we're developing a, a performance based design solution for the use of the adaptive thermal comfort model, uh, again within ASHRAE 55 and would recommend that if you are uh, using JV3 or JV1 or JV2, but your building is mixed mode or naturally ventilated, don't use PMV, use the adaptive thermal comfort model instead. It has a, has a wider, wider range of... Uh, uh, well, it suits that type of building uh, much better. Uh, just 
a note on PMV of plus from one or minus one, that roughly equates to 75% of people saying that they're comfortable. So we're saying that 75% of people in the building need to be uh, comfortable most of the time. Okay, so in relation to what's actually changed within how you model a building, so with how you model your reference building, how you model your proposed building, going forward, there are a few things that we have uh, tweaked or tightened up. Um, and these are now specified in JVA and JVB. So previously, if you, for those of you familiar with JV3, there was uh, a whole lot of detail within JV3 itself about how you do reference modeling and then uh, specification JV, which was all of your schedules, turning on times, turning off times. There's now three specifications, and with the uh, first one being JVA, which are all of those things which I mentioned earlier in uh, response to the question which your energy model is assuming is being done in terms of the construction process which it relies upon for your energy model to be correct. So this is that your installation is being installed correctly, that you've done your thermal bridging calculations when you're working at how much uh, installation you're putting in and, how, uh, and if you need a thermal break or not. It's the lighting control specification, so your lights are turning off and on at the right sort of time. Or your air conditioning or HVAC control specifications, which are detailed in J5.4, uh, I think, or 5.3. Uh, but all of those things that your energy model is assuming that it's going on, uh, you now have to separately show compliance under J JVA that these are actually being done. And we're doing that essentially to try and make energy models better predictors of actual energy use. Now, in terms of terms of JVB, there are a few things that we've tweaked there. The two things that I've highlighted there on the screen are we now have a tighter temperature range of 20 to 24 degrees. It used to be uh, 20 to 26 or 18 to 26. And air changes have been made at, uh, at 0.7 and 0.35 in terms of the assumptions that your energy model makes. Again, we think that that is better reflective of how, how a building is actually going to be operated and should produce a more accurate energy model going forward. So all, all of the changes we've made there are trying to increase the accuracy of modelling. There's also, just to highlight, uh, the way that you model services going forward with JV3 is a lot more detailed in terms of chiller startup times uh, and so forth. Uh, again, it's to, to really um, increase the accuracy of models. Okay. Just in terms of one final thing on modelling, so we've talked about Neighbours and Greenstar already. What we've now said explicitly within uh, JV3, and this is something you, you could have done previously as a performance solution, is that if you want to use the, the Neighbours scheduling, uh, the, the Neighbours uh, parameters, or the Greenstar uh, modelling parameters within your JV3 model, you can. Uh, and this is essentially to, to save documentation, save time, uh, not to have to repeat uh, energy models uh, after you've done your initial JV3. So especially if you're using JV3 for your design approval, but you know you want to get Greenstar points down the track or certify uh, uh, with Greenstar design and that's built or undertake a neighbour's commitment agreement, you can now use the, the neighbours or Greenstar parameters within your JV3 modelling so you don't have to slightly tweak your model go down the track going forward. So it's saying that neighbours equals Greenstar equals JV3, essentially. Okay, so that's all the changes for JV3 I wanted to highlight. Uh, just to talk quickly about JV4, which is a verification method for building ceilings. So it shows uh, uh, how you may comply with uh, part JP1E, which is around building, building ceiling. It's only for that part. This is not a whole of building verification method such as JV1, 2 or 3. It essentially says that if you are going to undertake a, a blower door test, you should do it in accordance with the standard, ISO 9972, and you should uh, hit these numbers in these climate zones for depending on the building type. So these are all in the code. Um, all of the slides today will be shared with you um, once we finish the, the last presentation up in, uh, in Perth next week. Uh, but essentially, JV4 is the parameters around undertaking a blower door test and the results that your blower door test should be producing. Uh, there are different parameters based on whether or not the building is a, a, a daytime operating building or a building that runs overnight uh, and depends on climate zones. So if you look closely at those numbers, you'll see that there aren't numbers in there for climate zones to invite for daytime operating buildings. Uh, that's essentially because we haven't got the evidence to show that uh, tightly sealed, sealed buildings in those climate zones are only operating during the day are actually more energy efficient. So it's something we 
were surprised about. But we did find when we uh, ran the numbers and then verified the numbers and then triple checked them that um, in mild climate zones, such as here in Sydney or um, up in southeast Queensland, um, you're not necessarily getting a huge benefit from sealing your building up tightly um, if it's not being run properly. Okay. I want to talk just briefly now we've finished the content, but things that you can expect coming out of the ABCB going forward. So we've touched on a lot of these today. So we have a number of calculators that we're uh, either updating or releasing. So we talked about the facade calculator or to give it its full title, the J1.5 wall and glazing calculator. Uh, there's also an update to the lighting calculator and we have a fan and pumps calculator for services and engineers so it shows compliance for either via method one or method two. Now there'll be a number of worked examples for each of those calculators and uh, some short video clips to go along with those as well. Uh, I direct you towards the the update we're doing to the handbook to Section J and the guide to Volume 1, which has a, a chapter on Section J. These handbooks go into a lot of detail around the intent of a provision and give you some examples of what would be a compliance solution. So it's all the stuff that you can't say within the code directly because the code is, a, is reference for regulation, but it allow, it's the explanatory text which, uh, if those of you familiar with Volume 2, is inserted directly into, the, the, into Volume 2, which isn't in Volume 1. But it's a good place to start if you're trying to get a handle on what the code is asking you to do. A number of these performance-based design solutions, so we've mentioned adaptive thermal comfort. Uh, we're working on one with the lighting industry about uh, the use of 1680 uh, to increase uh, minimum lux levels. Um, and also for those of you in services, uh, the use of Eurovent as uh, a certification pathway instead of AHRI. Uh, we mentioned the fact sheets uh, earlier for JV1, JV2, JV3, so going over the same sort of material we presented here today, but also uh, some information about thermal bridging, some, some comparison tables for typical construction to say if you add three uh, uh, R material insulation to a certain construction, it actually only equals 1.2 1, 1, 1. Uh, and a number of case studies that we're producing. Finally, if you haven't had a look already, I'd I uh, urge you to have a look at the digitised version of the National Construction Code. It's available on the ABCB website. The digitised version is designed to allow you to move back and forth really quickly between the provisions, the explanatory text, and also to other supporting materials. So within the code, you'll see uh, blue italicised text refers to a defined term. On the digitised version, you can click on that. It can bring it up uh, in terms of what the definition is. So that's where you, when you see your italicised total R value, it'll bring up the definition saying make sure you include your thermal bridging and also on the sidebar there'll be uh, materials related to uh, uh, helping you understand. So it's a good resource and it should help you um, understand and navigate the code more easily going forward. Um, all of these are expected to be released in the coming months. Um, please bear with us, we've had a lot of changes to the NCC uh, not just in energy, but we have uh, new provisions related to condensation, related to fire and so forth. Uh, we're getting them out as quickly as we can. We want to make, make sure that our, our quality assurance process internally is robust enough um, that we have materials which are useful and readable. Uh, the best way to get notification is to register on the ABCB website um, and indicate you have an interest in energy efficiency. Okay, so that's all from me today. Thank you all very much for coming today. There's a chance for more questions.